All right, so uh, my name is Sarah Hobart. I am a sports orthopedic surgeon at Towson Sports Medicine. I'm here today to talk to you about early sports uh, specialization. Will it lead to greater success? Um, so briefly about myself, I uh, was an avid basketball player when I was little. I played lacrosse, soccer. I remember my parents taking me to gymnastics, karate. Those didn't really stick very well. Um, but in high school, I was also a three-sport athlete, um, soccer, basketball, lacrosse. I did tear my ACL myself um, as a, uh, at the end of my freshman year, and that kind of uh, guided me to focus my pursuits a little bit more into soccer. Um, and in college, I played soccer, was a coach um, for her, a couple of youth teams. Post-college, um, as Phil mentioned, I was a goalkeeper coach at uh, Columbia University. Um, was also a youth soccer coach up there, but you know, since then I continued to play soccer. I played bocce ball. I played street hockey. I think that it's just important to stay active, but in um, different facets with different sports. Um, and then I've uh, since I have been a covering physician for the U.S. men's and women's uh, national soccer team. So, by the way, for those of you that didn't catch the game, we did win today. Um, I'm currently covering FC Baltimore, but covered the uh, LA Galaxy, the Amgen Tour California with the cyclists, um, and countless high school teams, rugby teams, boxing matches. Anyway, so um, I think that there's a lot to be said, and I've had a lot of experience with different sports. Um, so it's briefly on me. So the definition of early sport specialization is when an athlete age 12 or under is specializing in a single sport for eight months, at least eight months a year, um, and is playing that single sports to the exclusion of the participation of other sports. Okay, so this is going to limit deliberate play. And deliberate play is child-directed play, okay? And when you are limiting that, you're also limiting their rest from other sports, um, their development of other skills, socialization, and uh, childhood development. So why do we think that sports specialization is necessary? A lot of coaches demand it or recommend it. Um, a lot of parents actually push athletes and children into that direction because they're thinking that this will lead to the big college scholarship, that they'll go on to professional athletes. Um, there was a study in New York where they looked at uh, 240 parents and of athletes between the ages, I believe, of 10 to 14, and 57% of parents believed that their child was either going to play um, sports in college or be a professional athlete. And I'll go on to speak about the numbers shortly, but that is um, a, a, that blows it up a little bit out of purport, proportion. Um, not 57% of childhood athletes go on to be collegiate athletes. Um, and there's a lot of this is cultural. So um, there, as, there hasn't been any specific research that has substantiated um, this uh, sp early specialization uh, as leading on to greater athletic success. Um, there are studies that have looked at the 10,000 hour, hour rule in order to become a master at something. And this is all based on um, research from elite musicians. So this isn't based on athletics uh, specifically. Um, and uh, a lot of, uh, of the, why do we think we need sports specialization is necessary because there is recruiting and ranking in these athletes in middle school and high school. So it's kind of ingrained in us culturally. Another thing is when there was um, a lot of success in the Eastern European country, countries um, Olymp in the Olympics, when they had coaches come over to the United States, a lot of that was adapted in the United States as well with this early sports um, specialization, this intense year-round training principles. Um, they, they brought a lot of that as well. So the benefits of um, multi-sport uh, participation, and Kelly touched on this as well, is that we're talking about applying different stresses to our growth plates. Um, talking about getting balanced athleticism and fuller neuromuscular development, especially in these younger athletes that are 12 and under. And then you're gonna um, build on the intangibles that you can get from uh, being a part of multiple different teams. So team building, uh, time management, lifetime fitness and health, as well as uh, building lifelong friendships. Uh, 
and as I spoke about briefly before, the goals of early sports specializations, a lot of not, not only parents and coaches, but athletes as well are looking for those college scholarships, are looking um, to go to the Olympics and be professional athletes. Um, so when we're talking about percentage of high school athletes comp competing at the NCAA Division I level, when we're looking at on the men's side, um, out of all of the um, athletes in high school, only 7% of men's baseball go on to compete in college, and only 2.1% of those high school baseball athletes go on to play Division I. And this is from um, 2015 to 2016. So you're kind of looking at this and you're saying, well, of all the high school athletes, <coughs> ballpark from three to about 10% actually go on to play um, uh, college athletics. And for women, it's, it's a touch higher, but still we're talking about four, 10%-ish. And of, of, of those going on to division one, we're talking about one to 3%. And that same goes for men's and women's. Um, looking a little bit more, and then the chance of pr playing professionally, we're talking about, um, you know, fractions of a percent. So that was from 2015, and this is from 2018. And so as you can see, those numbers are, are ballpark the same. Things haven't changed over the past five years or so, even though I think this early sports specialization is really making that push even more so over the past 10 years. Um, but as you can see, this is for men, as you can see, these numbers are pretty low as far as from high school to college, um, and then the actual percentages of those going on to Division One. And Division One is when you're going to be talking about getting those athletic scholarships. But a lot of those athletic scholarships, at, when you're talking about average across the board, are around $11,000. And for um, you know a year at school, most of them are going to be a lot more than that. And this is for women, so similar percentages, though. Um, so is sports specialization necessary? When we're looking at the NFL first round picks in 2018, 30 out of 32 played multiple sports in high school. And there's many examples of highly successful athletes that were multi-sport athletes. I'm sure you guys can probably name more than me, but these were a few of them, Tom Brady, Michael Jordan, Deion Sanders. I mean, currently, um, the uh, Florida Gators uh, quarterback what was his name? He played uh, Tim Tebow. Yeah, is Aaron like Judge. now playing baseball. Sorry, Aaron Judge. Aaron Judge. Yes, yes. So there, there are many athletes that have gone on um, to play uh, professionally, but didn't start as um, didn't start as uh, early uh, specialization. Um, and there, there was a study of NBA players that played multiple sports in high school that fewer injuries, participated in more games, and had a longer NBA career. And what, there are certain uh, sports, such as gymnastics and figure skating, that do require early sports specialization, but then you look at those um, sports specifically, and early specialization may be required at a younger age, because peak performance is often attained at an earlier age in adolescence. So you know, you're looking at some of these gymnasts, and they're reaching their peak at in their early teen years. So that is something that I think is more of an exception to the rule. So when we're looking a lot at sports specialization scores, we this is usually done on a three-point scale. So you get one point for answering yes to each one of these questions. Does the athlete participate in a sport greater than eight months a year? Um, has the athlete quit other sports to focus on one sport? And is your primary sport more important than the other sports? So um, when we're looking at reported high school sports specialization and current um, Division I athletes, this was out of 2017 um, article looking at University of Wisconsin athletes. This involved 344 athletes, equal men and women. Um, and they found that the sports specialization, the highly sports or a special specialization, was only 14% in ninth graders. And then as these athletes got older, they did become a little bit more specialized. You can see by um, their senior year, 40% were scoring high specialization in their sports. But still, when you think about it, that still um, is 60% that weren't meeting all those criteria. And these were the athletes that went on to play um, college athletics. 
some other interesting takeaways from the study were that football athletes were less likely to be subspecialized. Um, and they also found that elite and national team athletes specialized later and, um, and participated in more sports during the high school um, years than the non-elite athletes. Um, and then finally, many of these athletes that were elite and national team had siblings or parents competing at the collegiate or professional level, which kind of implicates a genetic component to a lot of this. So is early sports specialization really going to lead you to that big scholarship? I think there's a lot of questions around that. So the risks of early sports specialization are numerous. I think some of the big ones are monetary costs. Um, injury is a, is a huge one, both acute and chronic, as uh, Kelly touched on previously. And psychological, these athletes burn out more quickly. Um, they go on, especially a lot of the females, go on to have their uh, female athlete triad, uh, go on to have eating disorders. And um, these others mentioned, but uh, also talking about final habitus. So a lot of these athletes that are specializing very early actually end up burning out and then they don't want to play anymore. And those are some um, individuals that end up going on to be obese or end up going on to having other medical problems because they were burnt out so early, um, so early on. Um, and so I was just talking briefly about the cost. The youth sports market in 2017 was nearly $20 billion. Um, and it's expected to double uh, in the next four years. So there are just tons of money being poured into this early specialization. Um, when we're talking about sports academies, this is an academy out in Hollywood. Um, and they built a high school football factory with a, a tuition of $75,000 and an $11 million um, training complex. And so this is, I think, the pinnacle of um, the commercialization, really, of youth sports. And we're talking more about the cost, so the cost of club sports. Um, this was as a, this was in 2000, the study of 2017. And I'm sure you guys have a ballpark idea on how much all these things cost. But when we're talking about club costs for a lot of these, we're talking about thousands of dollars a year. Um, and this is not even including a lot of travel and um, hotels. So it's a, a lot of money to uh, specialize and then what's the benefit of it uh, in the end. So um, talking about the injuries that a lot of these kids have, especially when we're talking about the younger ones, the ones 12 and below. So they, these are the ones that have open growth plates. A lot of these growth plates don't close. For um, women, a lot of them in the uh, lower extremities are around the age of 13, 14, and a lot of them males are probably around 15 or 16. So these are when these athletes are gonna be susceptible before their growth plates close. Um, and they can go on to have ligamentous injuries, which they're more susceptible to avulsion fractures when their growth plates are open. Some of the ligaments can actually pull off some of the ends of the bone. Uh, as well as having um, cartilage or chondral issues as well. You know, athletes can go on to have arthritis when they're having these same impact and repetitive um, movements, um, as well as OCDs. Uh, you know, the, you talk about the etiology of OCD, osteochondritis, desiccans. There are a lot of people say it's idiopathic, but a lot of people say that there's some um, uh, research that supports that this can be traumatic in nature as well. Uh, this was a study looking at the risk of injury and the months per year that these athletes were playing. This was um, uh, athletes between the ages of 7 and 18. They looked at over 200 athletes and they basically found that your risk of having a history of an injury is going to be greater the more months you participate per year. Um, these are some sports specific injuries that you can uh, have chronically. Um, we're talking about baseball. I know Kelly uh, spoke briefly about little leaguer shoulder, um, OCD of the elbow. These are why it's important to have things like pitch counts, especially in the young guys. Um, in gymnastics, you can get spinal stress fractures. You can get gymnast wrists where you actually end up closing your growth plates early in your wrist. Um, and then that can go on to chronic deformities of your hand and of your wrist. Uh, the, these are just many, there's many more examples. Um, when we're talking about injury to growth plate centers, 
the foot is a common area along the calcaneal uh, growth plate, so along the heel, and then some of the bones in your foot can actually um, go on to have this, what we call avascular necrosis, the bone can actually die, or there can be um, a inflammation, or what we call an apophysitis of these growth plates when you're repetitively using them, repetitively uh, straining them. Uh, this is just an image, an uh, uh, x-ray of a uh, little leaguer shoulder. And so, um, let's see if I can uh, get a, okay. So this is the growth plate right here. And basically there was such severe injury to this growth plate that um, it ended up forming this callus. So all this extra bone in this kid um, is going to be at an increased risk of this growth plate uh, closing. And this kid was 11 years old. Um, so, physeal injuries, meaning growth plate injuries, account for about 15% of all pediatric uh, sports injuries. So it's something that is extremely prominent. Um, this was when I was talking about um, the gymnast risk. So as you can see on um, this side, the, there is disruption of the growth plate. This is what the normal side looks like. And so it went on to early closure. And what happens is the other bone, your ulna, actually kept growing because it wasn't injured. And then you end up having impaction over this area. Um, and it, it can lead to long-term problems. So, you know, as an orthopedist, I would see that and I'd say, I probably need to surgery in order to shorten the other bone. Um, so there are definitely long-term ramifications. Um, this is uh, an example of a uh, stress fracture on the right. This is a CT scan. So we're looking at, um, at uh, a normal vertebrae on the top here, and then right here is a line where uh, there is the stress fracture. And we're, we're talking about Schmorl's node. So sometimes you can have such repetitive injury to your back, it actually ends up herniating your disc here into the vertebrae. Uh, and sorry, oh, is it, I thought it was. Um, uh, as I was talking about bony avulsion fractures, this is uh, examples of a growth plate actually getting pulled off by a muscle. Here, the A um, I I S or of the ischial tuberosity. So this is the hamstring actually pulling that growth plate off, um, and these can again lead to long-term issues, especially if they're not caught early. Uh, so ulnar collateral ligament injuries or Tommy John surgeries. So uh, James, Dr. James Andrews out of Alabama, he's the one that's done, he's a, one of the most uh, famous, I'd say, sports orthopedic surgeons. He's noted that there is an increase in these young athletes, uh, age 15 and younger, of these kids basically needing Tommy John surgery. And everyone says, oh, Tommy John surgery, um, you know, people do well after that. You know, I, there's data that says only 50 to 60 percent return to the level that they were at before. Yet, I remember in my residency, I'm working with pediatric orthopedists, and there was there's just this misconception that Tommy John is a great surgery, um, and uh, there were parents coming in requesting that their kid get Tommy John surgery, which is um, just. It's uh, crazy when their kid didn't even have an injury because they have this, this idea, there's this um, incorrect uh, notion that kids' arms get stronger with Tommy John surgery. Um, I met Tommy John and uh, he <laughs> certainly isn't <laughs> pitching anymore. I mean, he's had so many revisions and um, it, you know, yeah, he came back for a little while, but I think that there's, uh, we need to look a little bit deeper. Um, this is talking about OCD, that osteochondritis desiccant. This can happen in the knee, this can happen um, in the ankle, in the elbow, and a lot of times this can be um, precipitated uh, by some sort of trauma. So as I uh, talk about the consequences of burning out or of stopping the activity eventually, this can lead to things like childhood obesity, this can lead to um, depression, and it can lead to um, uh, not a full neuromuscular development. So these are all reasons um, in order to uh, not go on to early sports specialization. 
So some general recommendations, uh, just kind of closing up, is that I that a general guideline is that children should not participate in a single sport more hours per week than their age. Um, and if they do uh, partic participate more than their age, they should be monitored for indicators of burnout, overuse injuries, um, and decrements in performance secondary to this overtraining. Um, children should also have one day off a week from organized sports and, and be able to have that deliberate play. Uh, children should also have two to three months per year off from a single sport when we talk about that eight month uh, cutoff. Uh, children shouldn't participate in multiple sports or teams during the same season. I know there is definitely overlap and um, I, I think that it's okay when we're talking about older athletes um, doing multiple sports at the same time because I do think multiple sports uh, does have a lot of benefits. But um, I think when there are younger, there is some benefit to having that deliberate play in addition to um, limiting the number of organized uh, sports they have. Um, and not specializing until high school. Um, I just read an article about um, Alex Morgan. She's uh, one of the stars of the U.S. Women's uh, National Soccer Team. There's an article in Time Magazine, and it talked about how she didn't specialize in soccer until she was 14. Um, and even then, she was a multi-sport athlete. So uh, I think not specializing until high school, ideally once their growth plates are closed, quite honestly, which in a lot of uh, kids is 16 is a, is a good idea. Um, and then all youth can benefit uh, from this integrative neuromuscular training um, and with multi-sport athletes, you can improve your strength de deficits and uh, flexibility. Um, and then I know we talked a little bit about powerlifting, but I think uh, until they are skeletally mature, we just need to be cognizant of doing a proper um, progression. Uh, and then the emotional consequences of when they, they, they burn out. Um, so thanks for having me here today. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah. So I might have asked you this before, uh, Coach. Um, so when's a good age to start lifting? Um, not, not, not like powerlifting, just get introducing weights and stuff. Yeah, like yeah. I think once you reach high school, to be honest, is a is a good time to start introducing weights. So like 14, um, 15, yeah, now, yeah, around fourteen. Um, I, I think that if you're talking about light weights, low reps, I think that's okay. And as long as you're doing it in a supervised fashion, I think it's okay. But I see a lot of kids who just go to the weight room or the gym by themselves with very limited supervision, and I think that really sets up um, for injury. And so when you're um, when you have someone kind of teaching you how to do proper technique, then yeah, I think it's okay. But um, you don't want to overload those growth plates too yeah. much. Because I remember yeah. reading, this, reading this article about the Midwest and Nebraska and uh, 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 Iowa. Like, yeah. They were why Iowa had a great wrestling team, Nebraska had this. Yeah. And they, they always say about farm threat, um, that because they, they would get up, they weren't lifting weights, but they were doing chores, light lifting weights. And, yeah. you know, that, and these guys were like just huge monster guys that they were in their own state. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, and I, but it was probably some along the lines of they were probably doing a lot of high rep, you know, working in the, um, in the fields or what, what have you on the farms. Is this working? What I'm saying, they're working in the farm. Yeah. They're not, you know, we have, they're lifting hay. That's lifting yeah. weights. Yeah. You know, yeah. Or lifting yeah. whatever. But and it's something where size. they're not trying not to big. like max yeah. out on things, and so I think that. Um, that's probably a lot healthier than, say, right, right. going to the gym to try to yes, max yes. out your power yeah. lift or, or, you know, your... I always want to discourage yeah. my son and help my side. Yeah. Um, I do want to mention that the strength condition camp that we held here at Calvert Hall this week was designed for girls and boys ages 8 to 14. Mm -hmm. And in exercise science, there is biological age and there is training age. A biological age is the age that you are from the day you were born. A training age is your actual experience in training. So all the workouts that we design for kids in late elementary school to middle school are age appropriate, both biologically and in training age. So I had a kid who was actually one of my trainees in my private business. He signed up for my camp. And 
clearly his training age was much greater than everybody else's, so he had his own program. Some other kids came in and had no experience whatsoever in training, so we taught them how to lift and how to move, and the most they were ever picking up at any point in time was a 10-pound dumbbell. So if we are teaching little kids to lift with five pound weights, 10 pound weights, I don't really see a problem with that, provided that they are doing it under qualified supervision and that um, they're not just going into the gym, doing their own thing like adults would do, obviously. So I uh, hope that answers your question right there. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Are you participating in any sports specialization studies or do you think there not, should be any research? Not currently, uh, personally, but um, there are uh, studies ongoing looking at this. A lot of these are kind of broader population <coughs> studies, um, but I, I currently am not involved in any. But I think that looking at it more, especially on the injury aspect of things, you know, how many of these kids are injuring their growth plates or how many of these kids are burning out like if what's your actual risk of quitting beforehand and I think we have some good initial data on that but um, a lot of it is kind of circumstantial and what, what do we think happens um, so there has been any, or there's like more of a need for looking at people that have burned out. Yeah. So a lot of the studies that looked at this, and I can actually um, show you uh, a good um, summary of this. It looks at these elite versus non elite athletes, but it's very small numbers, and saying what did, what was the difference between these elite athletes and these non elite athletes. And a lot of it, go, a lot of these studies, but it's looking usually at 20 people. Yeah. Um, but a lot of them are looking and saying, you know, well, they didn't specialize until age 14, or they were multi-sport athletes. And I do think, you know, for, for better or worse, I think a lot of it, honestly, is a, is a little bit genetic. Um, so, you know, not that training and practicing isn't going to get you better, and isn't going to put you at a next level. But at some point, you know, just by sheer numbers, we're looking at one to three percent of high school athletes going on to play, you know, Division One, and a fraction of that going on to professional sports. You know, that you're you have to have something a little bit special, yeah. you know, besides a in addition to a hard work ethic and you know practicing right. and all of that. So, yeah. and the most of the research where you. Like, who's doing it? Who's conducting it? Um, a lot of these studies that I was looking at um, was looking at major universities or hospitals. Um, and that, But then a lot of the studies that I'm talking about, when I'm saying they're looking at elite, non-elite athletes, are actually European, looking at um, studies in, like, Belgium, uh, Russia, Germany. Um, so it's kind of all over the map. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have advice on how to intervene so like as a medical professional, athletic trainer, but also coaches, yeah. if you see kids that are on your team that are clearly getting burnt out, or like I know kids that they'll go to practice and then they'll go to the club practice. Soccer practice at the high school, club practice at night. Yeah. yeah. Like how do you yeah. talk to these? Well, I think, I think assessing like where is that motivation coming from? So there are studies that say um, when the influence that a coach has on uh, players and the influence that parents have on players. And so a lot of people that um, burn out have that kind of pressure coming from above. And so, you know, are they going to high school practice and club practice for the love of the game? Or are they doing it more because they're being a little bit pressured from outside? And it can be very subtle. So I think first establishing is where, where is their motivation coming from um, would be my first step, kind of taking them aside. You know, so are you enjoying this or is this like, is this too much? You know, especially in high school, I feel like a lot of kids are a little bit more pressured into that and, you know, they may want to go have their own, you know, deliberate play. 
with their friends and stuff. I think socialization, because when you think about it, how many of these people are going to go on to play college sports? And you know, playing I that study to go to every like all parents I work with or whatever. Yeah. That's. Oh, the numbers, the percentage, yeah, yeah. So, and it was like I said, and they were looking at athletes. Yeah, the, with that study out of New York, fifty-seven percent of parents were like, yeah, "My kid's going to go on to play college," or, uh, but when the actual numbers are probably closer to like three to seven percent. Yeah, exactly. So, and then you're looking at college scholarships. Like I said, that's going to be paying maybe a fraction. Yeah. So. What are our motivation like? Yeah. But good question. You know. Anything else? 